Okay, we should be in business now. We'll see if my computer can handle making a video that's this long. Anyways, um, so single trig function, that means one of these six trig functions. Sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, secant, cotangent. So your answer will not be in this form if you end up with something that looks like this, cosine over sine. That's not a single trig function. You need to go ahead and continue that and write what single trig function that goes along with. In this, in this case, that would be cotangent. When you're simplifying expressions, you're not working with two different sides of an equation. All you're doing is manipulating what you're given um, and then possibly canceling things out in order to simplify it down. But you still want to use the same strategies that we had before where it helps to first rewrite everything in terms of sine and cosine. Can you the first um, I think the answer key is on Moodle now. Trying to think about what other strategies would help with these things. Can you post these notes I got on the as well? Yes. And I will actually, like, the notes are going to post this time. I'm going to double check to make sure because I know they didn't post last time. Um, other algebraic type strategies that were helpful with these is to remember that you need a common denominator to add or subtract fractions. Um, another rule that we use a lot is this one. If you've got a compound fraction, so a fraction in the numerator and a fraction in the denominator, but both of those fractions have the same denominator, then you can get rid of those and just focus on what's in the numerator. So just be A over C? Correct. <coughs> you know, a lot of times you'll end up with denominators that are all sines or all cosines, mm -hmm. and that really simplifies the process pretty quickly. And then just make sure that you're using the uh, identities and everything that are going to be on the sheet. Again, the, the sheet that was with the practice test on Moodle, that's going to be provided to you on the test. So you don't need to put those on your note card. Um, you don't need the unit circle on your note card. But things like what I'm writing down here, these strategies and everything, those would be good things to add to your note card. Is it possible for like the numerator to have common, to be like common, and you can cancel that out, or is that not possible? To no, have? this is strictly a denominator type situation. Okay. Um, the reason for that is because when we divide fractions, it's the same thing as flipping the second one and multiplying. Um, so flipping the second one would be the, the one on the bottom, which turns it into B over C. Mm -hmm. And so... Oh, so it's the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess, really, if the numerator's matched... Yeah, yeah, it would be the same thing. Okay. I guess I should amend my answer then, because that, that was a good question. Um, just glancing at these four examples on the practice test, one other thing that you'd want to remember other than how to manipulate fractions is the fact that you can also uh, factor. So I'm looking at number three specifically. That looks like sine cubed plus cosine squared times sine. Both of those have a common factor of sine. And so we could pull a sine out to the front and that would leave us with sine squared plus cosine squared. Uh, and there would be t's next to those. I'm being kind of lazy right now in my writing. Um, and hopefully at this point, that's 
that that should be a red flag right there. Sine squared plus cosine squared is the the main Pythagorean identity, and that ends up just being one. So number three would simplify down to sine. So you can. Factoring helps. Other questions on what it means to simplify? Okay. The next batch of problems are the identities. So now we are working with two sides of an equation. And your job is to show that one side turns into the other, or that both sides simplify down to the same thing. Um, I'm not going to copy and paste all these over. There's a lot of them on here. I'll just include the directions on there, and then we'll take some notes. Okay, so strategies with these. Get my pen back up again. First strategy start with the more complicated side. For this example that we're looking at right here, to me a fraction is more complicated than a not fraction. So I would start with the left hand side instead of the right hand side. Again another strategy, write everything in terms of sine and cosine. And that's not it necessarily the next step that I would do with every single one of these. There might be some things that are uh, easy to do before you go to write everything in terms of sine and cosine. Um, like with number five there, well I guess the numerator is already written in, in terms of sine and cosine, but even if it wasn't, I might expand this out first before writing everything in terms of sine and cosine. It just depends on what would seem to be most convenient for me. Um, you guys have seen already in class that you can quite often go in several different directions with these and still end up with the correct answer. So more than one way to do these. So those two strategies, first and second one there, are pretty solid. From there, just some general things to try. They might take you in the right direction. They might not. It just depends. You can expand parentheses. Parentheses. There we go. You can try factoring. One of the most common factoring patterns that you're going to see with these things is the difference of two squares. Uh, it's not the only factoring pattern, but it's definitely one of the main ones. So 
So like if you see cosine squared minus sine squared then you could rewrite that as cosine plus sine times cosine minus sine and it's not uncommon for one of those factors to cancel out maybe with something in the numerator or denominator um, another strategy distribute division that might help with what you're looking at. I think actually it would help with this one up here. Um, here we start with a single fraction, but then on the right hand side there's actually two separate pieces of it. There's two, and then there's secant times cosecant. Um, so once you're, you know, when you're working with the left hand side on this one, you can distribute the division sine t cosine t and create two separate fractions getting added together that might end up simplifying into the two pieces that we have on the right hand side there. So basically taking a fraction and splitting it apart into two separate fractions. You need to make sure it's only the denominator that you can do that. Like you wouldn't split it apart into two fractions by distributing the numerator, if that makes sense. Um, I'm trying to think if there are some other algebraic strategies that really popped up a lot. If you guys remember in our notes, that's not the folder I wanted. What day did we do this? Last. What was this day? No, it wasn't. Not those notes. Yes, these notes. They would just load up already. Okay, if you guys remember, I was talking about this in class where we were comparing basic algebraic expressions and then they're their trig counterparts. These are all good algebraic methods to remember. We've got um, combining uh, using exponents, combining using coefficients, distributing, factoring out, and simplifying things that have the same denominator. So this slide has a lot of good strategies on it. You may want to refer back to that. Uh, let me even check the date on this one. Tuesday, October 28th, which actually, if I printed it for you, it, or if I posted it on Moodle, it may have actually said the 29th. I think I had, yeah, it should have been the 29th. I forgot to change the date. So it may have the wrong date on there. It may have the right one. I don't know. Um, which slide was that? The, it was the second slide in this presentation. This, is the, this was our first set of notes when we first started doing um, trig expressions and identities to begin with. So first set of notes from this unit has this in it. It's also got a summary of um, proving the identities. And we've already talked about these strategies. Start with the more complicated side, use the identities that you're given on those sheets, um, convert everything into sine and cosine.
Okay. That's all I'm really going to say about the proving the identities. Again, the answer key is up on Moodle. And so you can refer to that for each one of them. And just like it says on the practice test, on the actual test, there is going to be four choices. You have to do three of them. If you have time and you want to do the fourth one, then you can get extra credit for it. Um, even if you attempt it and you don't finish it, you can get partial extra credit for it. So it's definitely in your best interest to try all of them. But I'll, ba I'll basically be grading it as if there was just three of them there. And again, on that sheet that was on Moodle that went along with this with all the identities on it, I think there was some product sum and some product formulas. Um, I used to teach those formulas a couple semesters ago. I haven't in a while. Um, they just don't pop up as much as the other ones do. So don't worry, don't stress over those formulas. And if there is a problem on here that uses them, there will not be one on the test that uses them. All right, then we have trig equations. We take a picture of this and get it over to our Word document. I think I have about maxed out the uh, processing capabilities of my computer here with all this stuff running. Okay. Finding all possible solutions to trig equations. First thing that you want to do is isolate the trig function. By canceling all other numbers. For example, the one that we're looking at right here, we would need to get rid of the 14, we would need to get rid of the 4, and then we would also need to take the square root so that we got it all the way down to just the sine of x. Once you get the trig function isolated, refer to the unit circle. We would want a square root to get rid of the squared also. So it would be root 3 over 2. Sine x equals root 3 over 2. Um, we want to refer to the unit circle, and our goal is to identify the correct angles. There might be one, there might be two, there might be four. I can't think of any situation where there would be three correct angles to a single trig function. Um, there would be one angle if your answer was on one of the axes. Maybe the positive x-axis, maybe the negative y-axis. Um, there would be two if you were looking for maybe a certain positive sine value where there's two places on the unit circle where sine is positive 
um, that'd be the first quadrant and the second quadrant. So you would have an angle answer in the first quadrant and an angle answer in the second quadrant. Or if you ha end up having to take the square root to solve like you do in this situation, then that means you're going to have a plus or minus in front of your answer. Uh, and in that case, you would have four answers because you're looking for all the places where what we said the result of this one would be we had sine x is equal to plus or minus root 3 over 2. That means you would have four angle answers that would go along with this because there is an angle in each quadrant that has root 3 over 2 as the sine. Some places it's positive, some places it's negative. And whatever those four angle measurements are, to show all possible solutions, you need to make sure and add on this type of thing that shows that you can do multiple revolutions. We also showed in class that in some situations, like where you have four answers like this, you can just list two of them and then add on half revolutions instead of full revolutions. And it would still, that would cover all the angle measurements. Um, this is what you would put if your answer was in degrees, if your answer was in radians, you would need to add on the appropriate radian version of that 2 pi. <coughs> and I believe that solving trig equations is what was, uh, I had a video of that up on Moodle, right? That's what I, what we did for Halloween. Refer to Moodle video. Have a good night, you guys. I have like 10 minutes to work. Okay. I want my blank page to go in underneath this. No, oh, not as a footer. Like okay, fine. I will do it out of order. We will use this blank page. I'll clean it up later. I think we're just about finished anyways, right? Aren't we moving yeah, on? Aren't we 16, pretty much to the stuff? 18, that's 18, 19, 21, yeah. And then like one more page. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and that's all the stuff that we went over this evening. Yeah. Um, so like I don't think I need to go over number 26 because we pretty much spent all of class doing a problem that was yeah. just like that. Um, I guess I will, I'll go do like the, the stuff that you would need for, for these things. And then that should pretty much be all you need to study. <gasps> One of these might be a good example of when it's beneficial to draw the angle out in order to see where your answer should be. That's not what I want. Okay, uh, converting to polar form. Yeah, I do always sketch just to make sure. I think maybe with one of these, if you try taking the inverse tangent, you end up uh, with an error. Yeah, it's with 17. Um, so he has an error? Uh, if you just blindly use the formula as it does. I'll show you what I mean. So you suggest to sketch that one out? Yes. And so since you uh, might not be able to recognize ahead of time which ones you should sketch and which ones you shouldn't, it might be good to sketch all of them out. Yeah. Um, but when we're going from rectangular to polar, so rectangular is xy, polar is r theta. When we're going from rectangular to polar, we find the r value by 
using the Pythagorean theorem, and so I'm going to put the solved version of it, square root of x squared plus y squared. We find theta by using inverse tangent of y over x. Um, so if you look at 17, the x value is 0, which means you would end up doing inverse tangent of negative 4 over 0, and anything with 0 in the denominator is undefined. So your calculator would give you an error message. But if you just sketch that out, <coughs> the rectangular point, 0, negative 4, so we're going no horizontal direction, but we're going negative 4. I mean, you guys can. There's 0, negative 4. You guys can look at that and see what angle you would have to travel through to get from the positive x-axis to that point. That's 270 degrees. Or if we were doing radians, oh, nope, this says use degrees. And we wouldn't need Pythagorean theorem to figure out what that magnitude is because it's not diagonally out, it's just straight down on the axis. So the polar coordinate for that would be 4 and 270 degrees. That's the answer? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that came from, the 4 came from the coordinate. If I, can you see how, you know, if I, if I graph this, I am 4 units down from the origin. For the polar, I don't need the negative anymore because going to that location is what the rotation part of it tells me. Yes. Had to think carefully about that. Sometimes you're given polar coordinates and they give you the magnitude using a negative number. Um, but when you're actually when you're starting with rectangular and then transitioning over to polar, you won't have negative magnitudes. You'll always have positive. Uh, On the actual test, it's exactly like the practice test. Like so I think there's 26 right on the practice test, so there will be 26 on the actual test. Okay, um, so I wrote down what you needed to go from rectangular to polar using those coordinates. If you're going from polar to rectangular, the x-coordinate of your rectangular coordinates would come from the r-value times the cosine of the angle that you're given. And the y-value would come from the r-value times the sine of the angle that you're given. And on this one I'm going to put a reminder to check your calculator mode. Right. It needs to be in whatever your angle is given in. So you can see, like on this example, number 19 and number 21 are both in radians. Calculator needs to be in radians. Okay. Number 20, calculator needs to be in degrees. So those should probably be pretty quick for you on the test. Kind of just plugging and chugging on those. All right, so then we've got these. Um, I probably should talk about the unit vector form. We didn't really go over that during the homework. So let me take a picture of this.
I think my computer is hating on me right now. I've got too much stuff open. our desktop recorder here for a second. Okay, so on this one we're given some vectors. Your job is to combine them and then also express them using component form and then unit vector form which we haven't done a whole lot of but is a piece of cake. It's just a matter of understanding how the notation works. Pull my pen back up here again. Okay, um, so on this first one, you're supposed to figure out what the component form of 2m would be. You can draw the vector if you want, but you don't have to. You can really just take the components of m and multiply them both by 2. So the component form for this one would be negative 4 and 6. Um, just like it says in the direction, grids have been provided for your convenience, but they're not going to be graded. It does say show your work or explain your reasoning. Um, that really only matters to me if you get the answer wrong because I have to have a way to give you partial credit. If you're confident in what you're doing and that your answer is correct, um, I'm not going to take off points if you don't show your work for these. Unit vector form, the uh, unit vector for the horizontal was I and then the unit vector for the vertical was J. And usually we show those two getting added together. It looks like a sum. So the unit vector form for this one would be negative 4 i plus 6 j. Where did my negative go? There we go. And you don't need the... Uh, right. On this one, brackets are not needed. Okay. It's essentially like... Um, it would be... Uh, like, remember in class when I when I said that a vector is like you, you can show the components separately or you can show the final result. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of like showing the components separately. Okay. It's still the same vector but it's showing the two separate pieces. How many horizontal units you're showing, how many vertical units you're showing. Okay. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Unless you guys feel like you need me to do more examples of anything. Can you mm -hmm. remind me like what the um, the I is like a single horizontal unit vector. And so what this is telling me, like if I were to draw this out, let me pick a random starting point. I'll just start, uh, let's see, my horizontal is negative. I'll start over here. So if that was my starting point, um, this is telling me to go to, to use negative four horizontal units. So there's one horizontal unit, two, oh, come on now. Two, three, and four. So it's like taking four vectors that are one unit apiece and putting them all together to make your full horizontal vector. Um, and then you do the same thing vertically, but using six, three, four, five. And so the final vector that would result from this would go back to your original starting point and then end at your final ending point. Uh, okay. Right. Uh, Any other questions? I'm going to stop this recording before it crashes my computer.